2019, presentation of the fund to alleviate COVID-19 economics, known as FACE. Thank you to the government of Costa Rica and ECLAC for convening the panelists and you, the participants, of this meeting. My name is Richard Blewett, I'm the head of delegation and permanent observer to the UN of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. And it's my pleasure and great honor to be your moderator today. This event will serve as the official presentation of FACE, the Fund to Alleviate COVID-19 Economics, proposed by the government of Costa Rica. The event seeks to increase visibility and garner international support for the proposal in preparation of the meeting of heads of state on September the 29th, 2020, in the framework of the Financing for Development in the Era of COVID-19 and Beyond initiative. The event will also enable discussion on the mechanisms and build partnerships towards operationalizing and implementing FACE as a viable option for addressing the social and economic impacts of the pandemic in developing countries. We will begin with an opening remarks from Amina Mohammed, uh, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Then we will hear from His Excellency Pedro Sanchez, President of the Government of Spain. He will be followed by His Excellency Carla, Carlos Alvarado Caseda, the President of the Republic of Costa Rica, who will introduce the fund. Then we will hear from our distinguished panel, followed by interventions from the floor, two-minute interventions from the floor. Launching straight into it, I would like to share with you a short humanitarian perspective on the COVID-19 economic crisis. The COVID pandemic has caused so far the loss of a million lives. We are at the beginning of a marathon. We are not in a sprint. Sadly, we see families in situations where they're forced to choose between the virus and hunger. Within these contexts, persons with disability, members of the LGBTQI community, women and girls, older people, and undocumented persons experience layered vulnerabilities. The World Food Programme warns that the number of persons suffering acute hunger will nearly double in 2020, reaching 270 million. Any decline in government services and development financing will result in a growing humanitarian landscape. This should be avoided at all costs. Climate disasters will also continue to create a dual COVID-19 climate crisis. As humanitarians, we emphasize the importance of equitable distribution of PPE, affordable therapeutics, and a people's vaccine for COVID-19. No one is safe until everybody is safe. Protecting the most vulnerable people with a, with a COVID-19 vaccine is a humanitarian imperative. But given experience to date, it's going to be exceedingly difficult to deliver this imperative. To mitigate the growing humanitarian landscape and to really have a chance of building forwards, we need creative solutions like the proposed fund to alleviate COVID-19 economics face. To give further context to the impacts of COVID-19 and the need for extraordinary support funds like FACE, I welcome Ms. Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, via video message. Excellencies, I commend Costa Rica and ECLAC for this initiative, which amplifies our joint efforts for a stronger recovery. Six months after COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, the unprecedented global emergency continues unabated and risks unraveling years of development gains. What began as a health crisis with devastating economic impacts has become a humanitarian catastrophe. Nearly 1 million people have died from the virus. 100 million people could be pushed into extreme poverty and an additional 270 million people could face acute food shortages by the end of this year. The measures taken by the international financial institutions, multilateral and regional development banks have helped, but far more must be done. Many countries have been excluded from the emergency response. This crisis has highlighted the limits of traditional income-based measures of vulnerability. Many middle-income countries, small island developing states, and tourism-dependent economies have fallen outside the scope of relief measures and have proven particularly vulnerable to the detrimental health, social, and economic impacts of COVID-19. This is why, since the beginning, the Secretary General has been calling for a massive, coordinated, comprehensive multilateral response 
that amounts to at least 10% of GDP. In May, Canada, Jamaica, and the Secretary General convened a high level event to explore concrete financing solutions. In the four months since, six discussion groups have worked on an ambitious menu of policy options. Next Tuesday, heads of state and government will come together to take stock and consider the path ahead. We are pressing for them to make bold choices to secure our common future. Even though some countries have controlled the virus and experienced a slight economic rebound in recent months, the impact of the pandemic will be with us for years to come. New and existing funding mechanisms and facilities to provide targeted fi financing to vulnerable countries will be crucial, particularly in developing countries that lack the fiscal space to finance robust responses. We must act now to avoid mutually reinforcing crises. I thank you for your leadership in helping the world turn the tide. Thank you and best wishes for this important event. Now I'd like to turn to introduce uh, remarks to be made by uh, His Excellency Pedro Sanchez, President of the Government of Spain. in the uh, found to alleviate uh, COVID-19 economics. In addition to the severe uh, health crisis, which has already claimed hundreds of uh, thousands of lives, we're facing uh, devastating economic and social crisis comparable to the Great Depression. Global poverty will increase for the first time since 1998, and more than 70 million people risk failing into extreme poverty. We cannot allow this to happen. I refuse to revert the progress achieved over the past decades. To avoid it, we must act now together. First, we must have a clear horizon. The way out of the crisis must lead us to achieving the SDG and to a more sustainable economic model that leaves no one behind. How we respond to this crisis will save the world for the future generations. This is a tremendous responsibility, but also an opportunity to do things better. Second, we must act globally because the fate of all countries is interlinked. Failure in low and middle income countries uh, will translate into failure in high income countries and macroeconomic instability. The European Union has understood the importance of responding jointly to this crisis. The agreement reached in July by the European Council will allow the mobilization of unprecedented resources on a continental scale. But not all countries have uh, the same instruments at hand. This is why we must uh, commit to finance, financial multilateralism. International financial institutions are called to play a critical role in overcoming this global crisis, contributing to a balanced recovery across countries. I am particularly concerned about countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. The region is in the midst of uh, the deepest uh, economic crisis since uh, World War II. This is why we gathered last June at a high-level conference to call upon international financial institutions to extend support uh, to the region. A country's uh, income level uh, cannot define it. Middle-income countries must also, has, must also have access to the necessary international support in order to reactivate their economies. Third, we must bear in mind that all countries are financially strained because this is a crisis that affects us all. Therefore, we must um, be creative to overcome the limitations imposed by reality and enhance efficiency. That emphasize the need uh, of acting together, relying on international and regional mechanisms. It also underscores uh, the need for the new fund uh, to alleviate uh, COVID-19 economics to be aligned with uh, other initiatives and coordinated with the efforts led by the UN Secretary General. I therefore welcome the creation of the FACE Fund and hope it will become instrumental in supporting a balanced and swift uh, global recovery. Finally, 
I would like to recognize the leadership of uh, President Alvarado in launching this uh, very important initiative. Gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And now I would like to move on to His Excellency Carlos Alvarado Queseda, President of the Republic of Costa Rica. And he will now tell us about the FACE Fund, Mr. President. Thank you, Richard. Excellencies, dear Pedro Sanchez, President of the Government of Spain, Deputy, Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohamed, dear Alicia Barcena, Executive Secretary of the CLAC, and all distinguished friends who accompanies us today. The Secretary General called us for action and action is what face is all about. It's about facing what is happening today in the world. An unprecedented number of 102 countries have requested emergency financing from the IMF and to address COVID-19 on the shock of what has happened in our economies. The Secretary General gathered a group leading by Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, and Prime Minister of Jamaica, Andrew Holmes, to start working on initiatives to address this. So Costa Rica became part of this group, and we are presenting FACE, the fund to alleviate COVID economics as a concrete option to address this. That's why it has to be ambitious. That is why it has to be innovative, because the situation, frankly, it's very difficult across the globe. A global problem requires a global solution, and FACE is a global solution. I will first go directly and cut the chase directly to what the proposal is about, and then I'm say why is so urgent for us to advocate for this solution and this kind of solution and discuss about it and recruit all the support around the globe from emerging economies from poor and rich countries as well to make such an ambitious initi initiative true. What is it that we are proposing? We are proposing to create a fund with many resources. That is to say, we're going to ask and request, recruit the countries that represent 80% of global GDP to contribute with the amount of approximately the equivalent of their 0 0.7 GDP to fund this. This is going to be about half a trillion dollars to build up this fund. But this fund will represent for the rest of the countries, the emerging economies and the poor economies, the equivalent of 3% of their GDP. That is to address the problems caused by COVID-19. And this 3% is to beneficiate those countries in need. The phase funds will be destined to mitigate the economic impact on the countries, on their productive sectors, and on households caused by the economic crisis, and to revive economies and to build back better, but making it a reality. Also to recover once the pandemic is overcome. This is critical to reach the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda. FACE will be lent to countries with concessional and solidarity terms 
We are proposing loans at 50 years term with five years of grace period and a rate of 0% interest rates or fixed at current prevailing rates, which are close to zero. This is not a grant. It is a loan that will be repaid in full. However, we propose these terms, which are commensurate with the extraordinary circumstances which go beyond financial policies. The beneficiary countries, with the advice of the financial institutions or regional economic commissions, will establish an accounting system and a registry of statistics to identify the fiscal cost of the pandemic, both the direct cost of dealing with it and the derived from its economic consequences and the policies. This will contribute to a sterling accurate amount of each loan by needs and vulnerability rather than generalized classification like income per capita. As their contribution in these dire circumstances, we are requesting that financial organizations will not charge for the intermediation and administration of phase resources. And this, will, this is an important point. FACE is not creating new bureaucracy or new institutions. FACE is about capitalizing and providing international finance institutions with this capital, with these conditions to help emerging economies and to help poor countries. FACE will be lent without fiscal, monetary, or structural conditionalities. Are these, these are already being tackled by the standard lending facilities of IMF or World Bank, but with requirements of good governments and steady fight against corruption from countries. This is also important. And I want to underline this. IMF and World Bank and other financial institutions are doing an extraordinary work today. As I mentioned, more than 102 countries have gone already to the IMF in this situation. But more effort is required and we need to go beyond that. And that is what FACE is all about. We want and we need to go beyond current efforts. The reimbursement of FACE resources will be fully aligned with the fulfillment of the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs, building resilience and achieving the targets of multilateral environmental agreements such as countries' national determined contributions to accelerate progress towards sustainable development in the decade of action. Lastly, international financial institutions will maintain the assessments and dialogues on the macroeconomical and structural conditions on each country, which prevailed prior to the crisis caused by the pandemic to preserve fiscal and monetary stability, as well as sustainability. So those are the main points of what FACE is all about. But now I want to go to the justification of FACE. As I mentioned, a global problem requires a global solution. The pandemic is increasing inequality not only within the countries, but a global inequality. And we have, as we have seen, the recovery, even now, it's uneven. Those economies that have the fiscal space and the resources, as we have seen in China, in the United States, and in the case of Europe, have gathered the packages and the measures to protect their growth and their economies. 
I underline the example of Europe preserving not only their economies, but building to have a greener rebirth after the crisis. But if the developing world, if the emerging economies and the poor economies do not have access to this kind of resources, the rebound is going to be very uneven. And this is not only going to impact the world economy. This is going to impact things such as migrations, for example political and democratic stability within our countries, given the difficult situations. This is going to impact international trade if we don't act now. Even the rich countries are going to see a decrease on their trade terms with emerging and poor economies, given that increase of unemployment, poverty, and that the reduction of our growth is going to make us buy less and trade less with the richer economies. This is also going to harm the developed world. Security is also going to be an issue. In emerging and poor countries, situations like drug trafficking, human trafficking, and then and many other illicits might find their way in this complex situation. And also, if the situation is so difficult to achieve the goals of the 2030 Agenda, and particularly the goals on climate change and the climate crisis is going to be more difficult. Today is the kind of occasion in which solidarity and altruism, doing what's correct, doing the best for the whole of the world, is also aligned with the self-interest of all. There's not going to be individual or national welfare or well-being across the globe if we don't have regional or global solutions and well-being across the globe. That is, that's what FACE is all about. I want to thank all the team that has worked to put this together, also the leadership of Secretary General Guterres, of Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohamed, of Prime Minister Trudeau, and of Prime Minister Holmes, Holmes leading this team. And Costa Rica is committed not only to be part of the discussion, but to put forward a concrete solution to be discussed for which we are very willing to advocate and to make it happen. And now what we call upon all the world leaders, all from the academia and other stakeholders in public and private sector is to build upon this proposal, but particularly to take action and make it happen. Thank you very much, Richard, and all who are part of this event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, President uh, Alvarado. You have presented an incredibly compelling case and context within which uh, the world needs to act. Um, we're now going to move into a panel discussion where a number of very important panelists will look at the current financial crisis and the applicability of the FACE proposal presented by His Excellency, uh, the President of Costa Rica, in the context of the fiscal and developing financing challenges brought about by COVID-19. The first panelist uh, I would like to introduce is Ms. Alicia Barcena. It, she is the Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, and the co-sponsor of this event. Ms. Barcena has also served as Under Secretary General for management at the United Nations headquarters in New York and as chef de cabinet and deputy chef de cabinet 2006 to 2007 uh, to the former Secretary General, uh, Mr. Kofi Annan, among other leading roles in the UN. Madam Executive Secretary, what are some of the key features of FACE 
that makes it such a valuable initiative for all developing countries, including middle countries, and how can face be enhanced? Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Moderator, Richard, actually. Thank you, uh, President Alvarado. I just want to pass a, a little commercial here. President Alvarado is also the chair of ECLAC, uh, so we are very proud uh, to co-sponsor this event. I want to start by saying that FACE is pertinent, opportune, and necessary. Why? Because developing countries are confronting the emergency with a, very, with a lot of difficulties. They have put in place a lot of measures to strengthen aggregate demand and boost domestic market. But many governments have a significant increase of budget deficits and debt. And, and given the scale of, of the socioeconomic impact, it is essential for developing countries, regardless of their income levels, I want to underline this, regardless of their income levels, to have access to additional and concessional funding under exceptional financial terms. And this is what FACE is providing, is providing exceptional financial terms that include low interest rates, grace periods, longer term repayment, and exemptions from commission payments and charges in general. FACE calls for international institutions to inject liquidity into the countries in need. And this is urgent because in a globalized world, the same rationale behind the monetary and the fiscal uh, largesse that has been implemented by high income countries towards preventing bankruptcy and rescuing and rescuing local firms is what we need for the emerging, emerging and, and developing countries. We need to understand that the financial stability is a global public good and, and, therefore, and that this crisis is systemic. So uh, as a systemic crisis and as a global crisis, it definitely needs a global response. So let me, let me uh, mention some of the elements that I think are very essential in the FACE proposal. Number one, FACE redistributes liquidity from developed to developing countries. This is urgent. Liquidity is there, and, and that liquidity, I have to say, has, has been built up uh, uh, tremendously in, in COVID because the fiscal response, for example, uh, amounts to $11 trillion uh, worldwide. The central banks of, of the United States, Europe, Japan, and the UK have injected already $2.4 trillion into their economies, and the money supply in the US has more than doubled between the first and the second quarter of 2020. So the money supply has increased from 7% to 20% in the second quarter of 20. So liquidity is there, but it needs to be allocated where it's needed the most. So th this is essential and, and we cannot continue affording the, uh, the, the, the outflows of capital from emerging economies, more than $103 billion went from emerging economies to, to the developed world. I mean, come on. So, number two, FACE is an initiative that comes from a developing country, but is dedicated to all developing countries, regardless of their level of income, as I said. And, and FACE does not draw a line between developing countries, between middle and low income countries. And this is essential because DSSI of the G20 draws a line and says, this is for low-income countries, middle-income countries are not included. So we, we cannot uh, afford that because uh, middle-income countries are home to 75% of the world population and account for 96% of the global debt of the world, 96. So if there is a crisis of insolvency in the middle-income countries, we will have a systemic effect on financial stability. So. Uh, I think this is essential. This is, this is an initiative that goes to everyone, regardless of their income level. And the objective of FACE is to mitigate the social impact, of course, including individual and productive sectors, but also in certain way, how the recovery is going to come up in line with Agenda 2030. I mean, so, and, and, and this, is, this is why it's so opportune needed because the world needs to have a, a 50 year, let's say, vision of where, how can we change the development paradigm? So uh, now the other thing, the, 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 the other element that I want to, uh, to mention, Richard, very quickly 
is that phase could be increased in size. Come on, the 0.7% of GDP is nothing. Compare it with the 10% that the, the Secretary General is calling for. So 0.7%, I mean, uh, the, the equivalent of phase is 0.7% is 0, 0 of GDP of the developed countries, okay? And 3% of the developing countries. Now, the Secretary General is calling for a 10% of GDP. So frankly, the size of phase could be, could be uh, I mean, increased very much indeed. Because we're talking here of $560 billion. Honestly, the world can do better. So we are calling for an increasing in size of phase, by the way. And, 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 the, and the, the, the last element is that I think that phase should be conceived as a revolving fund. That is, a, a, since it's not a grant, since, since countries have to repay, and, and honestly, I think a, I would say a global pack has to be there that countries that can repay before the 50 years should do it. And then FACE could become a revolving fund. This is a very Keynesian principle, I have to say, but we definitely believe that FACE can, can do that. And finally, because I know I only have five minutes, finally, to increase, we, we believe that this initiative has also to be complemented. And of course, you know that we are advocating for that with initiatives to reduce debt and to uh, to alleviate the, the payment of interest rates. And I know Pakistan is with us, and I, I know Ambassador Akram has been very, very, I would say, active on this push to have debt alleviation and debt service alleviation. And we are calling for debt service alleviation for the Caribbean countries. The total debt of the Caribbean is only 57 billion. And we are asking for seven billion to create a Caribbean Resilience Fund. So we do need that. And I just want to say, President Alvarado, thank you for this initiative. The world needs it. We need something of this sort to face one of the worst crises of the world. You can count on us wholeheartedly. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Alicia, for a very passionate and analytical uh, uh, kickoff for our panel. I would now like to move on to Richard Thorpe's Wright. He's the director of the Division on Global Globalization and Development at UNCTAD and a widely published author in economics. Uh, Richard, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Richard, for that introduction. And thank you to Costa Rica for this uh, invitation. Um, we are particularly pleased to make a presentation here because the FACE initiative has a lot of parallels with the work that we have been doing in UNCTAD uh, since the crisis. And in particular, our idea that what we need is a, glo uh, a Marshall Plan for a global health uh, recovery. And I think there are three introductory points about uh, the overlap between FACE and our work that I'd just like to stress. Um, the first one is that recovering better is an integrated challenge. It's about health, it's about sanitation, it's about food security. You can't deal with these things separately. You have to deal with them together. And it's about integrated policy. This is not just about macro or finance, but it's about trade policy, it's about industrial policy, it's about a whole series of related policy challenges. So integra an integrated approach, I think, is something that we have in common. Um, it's public sector led. I think it's important to stress that in, at, at this moment in time. Um, we're talking about the delivery of public goods, as Alicia said, and public goods are best delivered by the public sector. It's not a fashionable position, but it happens to be historically the case. Um, but it's also the case that the resources to get us out of this crisis are going to be from the public sector. We've seen this in the G20. $13 trillion worth of, of resources have been mobilized by the leading G20 countries. This is public money. The private sector is not in a position to provide this. They're nervous. If you're a firm, you're nervous about the, the, the future investment prospects. If you're a consumer, you're uh, nervous about your future employment prospects. It's not going to come from the private sector. It has to come from the public sector. And related to that, and uh, as, as President Alvarado said, fiscal space is the big challenge here, and it's a particularly big challenge for developing. Uh, countries, not just LDCs. I think, again, that's important to stress. This is as much a challenge for middle income and higher 
uh, uh, middle income developing countries as it is for uh, 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 LDCs. It's a point that we've been making in our recent trade and development report uh, we launched uh, last week. Um, let me go back, though, in my remarks to the notion of the, we choose the use of the term Marshall Plan very carefully. I mean, we're all talking about the class of 1945 and the 75th anniversary year, and the Marshall Planners were very much part of that tradition, of course. But there are elements of the Marshall Plan that I think we need to keep in mind when we're talking about this kind of initiative from FACE, uh, uh, like, like FACE. The first one is the Marshall Plan was generous. 1% of US GDP was channeled to Europe for four years between 1948 and 1952. If you do that, if you calculate that in, in today's currency, that's $210 billion a year was channeled to Europe. Um, the, if you, now, I don't think, unfortunately, we're going to get that kind of money from the United States currently. But if you put that into the DAC countries, if they hit the 0.7% target, it may not be enough as Alicia said, but if they hit it, that's an additional $380 billion a year. That's not a bad platform from which to begin this kind of initiative. So generosity is critical, as it was to the Marshall Plan. Uh, integrated, as I said, an integrated perspective. And that uh, is, was also central to the Marshall Plan. And, and that was true, not just in terms of policy, but also in terms of financing. Uh, debt was part of the Marshall Plan. Debt suspension was part of the Mar Marshall Plan. Debt suspension led to debt cancellation with the German Debt Conference of 1953. A critical component of the rebirth of Europe was debt cancellation, and we need to keep that in mind when we're talking about the kinds of challenges that developing countries face. It was flexible, the Marshall Plan. It was mainly grants, in fact. Uh, uh, President Alvaredo said this was not grant-based, but the Marshall Plan was mainly grants. There were some uh, low or zero uh, interest loans, but it was, main it, it was mainly uh, based on grants. But the flexibility of the Marshall Plan, I think, from a financing point of view, was critical. And it, it, was, it was tolerant, the Marshall Plan. It, it focused on, the, on local needs. Local ownership was very important. Local institutions uh, were very important. So, so all those features are critical. The difference between then and now, I think, that we, we need to focus on is that we have development banks today. We have reg regional development banks, we have multilateral development banks, and we need to scale up their lending to complement any sort of uh, aid effort that we think would be necessary for the FACE initiative or indeed for a, the Marshall Plan that I, I talked about. The, the capital base of these institutions needs to be increased. That's money from shareholders. We could use special drawing rights as a source of, of capital. That's an old argument that UNCTAD has talked about for a long time. It's gone into, um, uh, it's been forgotten recently, but it, I think it should be re revived. We could talk about the use of international tax revenues, where the OECD is now trying to clamp down tax evasion. Some of that money could be channeled into the development banks to, to uh, support this kind of initiative. The resources are there, as Alicia said. This is not a world that is short of resources. It's a, it's a world that is short of the imagination to use those resources that support the vast majority rather than a small uh, my, minority. And I think, I think that, that was a, a message I think we should think about in the context of our uh, 75th anniversary. I think that sense of a, of a, of a commitment to um, a, a global commons and a global public good was pretty. Let me just end with a, qu a quote from uh, Roosevelt. And his quote, I think, is very. I think it's a very uh, appropriate one for this for this moment uh, in time. Roosevelt, in in his statement to the Bretton Woods Institution, 1944, said, "Economic diseases are highly communicable. It follows, therefore, that the economic health of every country is a proper matter of concern to all its neighbours, near and distant. Only through a dynamic." And a soundly expanding world economy, can the living standards of individual nations be advanced to, to, to the levels which will permit to all, the full realization of all our hopes for the future? And I think that's the kind of spirit, that sense of a common good and a collective endeavor is exactly the, the impulse behind FACE, and it's the kind of initiative that we, we, we sorely need well, given the challenges that now face many developing countries. 
Thank great, you. Great, great, great. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll now move on to uh, Professor Joseph E. Stiglitz. He's a Nobel laureate in economics and a university professor at Columbia University. He was the chief economist, uh, he is the chief economist at the Roosevelt Institute and a former senior vice president and chief economist, uh, uh, Professor Stiglitz. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this uh, important uh, initiative. I think the previous speakers have done a very good job of outlining the magnitude of the devastation to the health uh, of our citizens and to the uh, global economy uh, of the pandemic. Uh, they've also emphasized that it's, uh, while it's a matter of solidarity that we respond globally, it's also a matter of the self-interest of the developed country, countries. Uh, it's in their interest to help the LDCs, the emerging markets. We won't be free of the virus until all countries are free. And we won't have a robust recovery until all uh, countries are recovered. Uh, the consequences of not providing this money uh, are stark, and they've already been uh, outlined. Uh, and it's also been emphasized that a global problem requires a global solution, uh, a, a global solution that's innovative and is of the scope and urgency of this initiative. Before answering the question of the um, how best to administer it, I want to highlight two complementary measures uh, that have to be taken, and a couple of the previous speakers have talked about them uh, briefly. The first is the issuance of special drawing rights, SDRs. The IMF has called for a special issuance of $500 billion. Uh, that doesn't have to uh, be ratified by the parliaments of different countries. Uh, the only impediment at this point uh, is the United States. Uh, that uh, if uh, Secretary of Treasury would uh, endorse it, uh, we would have it. But actually, in the United States, there is a support for um, among many people for a much larger issuance. The House of Representatives has already passed a measure for two trillion dollars of SDRs, and it awaits uh, the Senate. Um, and I think in a new administration, one might have that. Interestingly, many of the developed countries in Europe, for instance, have already committed themselves to giving or lending their SDR issuance to the emerging markets in developing countries that need it. So this would be a powerful source of funding, uh, of potentially $2 trillion. The second relates to the looming debt crisis, which several people have alluded to. Uh, it's been, for the moment, partially forestalled by the enormous increase of, of liquidity uh, that Alicia uh, referred to. What is needed now is a commitment not just to a debt stay for the poorest countries and for official debt, but a debt stay embracing more countries the emerging markets, and again, as Alicia and others uh, have pointed out, this is not just a, a matter of LDCs, it's a matter of, of the emerging markets who don't have the resources that the developed countries have marshaled to address the problem. Um, but more than a debt stay is required, what is needed is a debt restructuring. The devastation of the pandemic has been sufficiently great that many countries will not be able to pay what they owe. In the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, I chaired a, a commission uh, appointed by the president of the General Assembly, and we recommended uh, the establishment of a framework for sovereign debt restructuring, uh, International Bankruptcy Court. And in 2015, the UN General Assembly overwhelmingly supported that kind of initiative. Uh, what I hope uh, me, uh, will be done now is that there, this uh, crisis provide the impetus for uh, the establishment of that kind of framework and that the 
countries in the advanced countries, developed countries, where much of the debt is written, incentivize private sector participation in both the debt stays and the restructurings. So far, there's been a very great reluctance of the private sector uh, to participate. I also should mention that there's an especial obligation of the reserve currency countries to participate in an initiative like FACE. The reason is that the developing countries and especially the emerging markets have been lending to the reserve currency countries at almost zero interest rate for years and years and years. And uh, in a sense, this is just a reciprocation of all the money that the developing countries and the emerging markets uh, have been lending to the reserve countries, roughly uh, 10 trillion or more a year. So uh, they've gotten that as a low interest loan. And what we're, uh, you can think of a face as a reciprocation for this long term lending program of the developing countries and emerging markets to the reserve currency countries. In many ways, we are lucky right now because over the recent years, our multilateral development institutions and the IMF have been changing very uh, markedly from what they were like 25 years ago when I was at the World Bank. Uh, they've embraced uh, uh, the concept of global public goods, the importance of uh, uh, having a green economy, uh, the commitment to the attainment of the SDGs, and a refrain that we've heard uh, repeatedly this morning is that we have to build back better, uh, the green recovery that Europe has emphasized. So they are actually in a good position to uh, manage these funds, not only to have a recovery, but to have a recovery that's consistent with the vision that uh, the previous speakers have shared, a, a green recovery, uh, a recovery marked by greater equality than we've had in the past, a recovery uh, consistent with the SDGs. Um, they have uh, the expertise, uh, the skills to monitor the use of funds. An important element that uh, uh, President of Costa Rica has emphasized is uh, there should not be excessive conditionality. Uh, the only condition should be that the funds be appropriately used uh, and they accord with the kinds of uh, vision that we have about a green recovery, uh, a recovery consistent with the SDGs. And uh, uh, that is really where the multilateral institutions are already. Um, the, the increasingly, they've been moving away from the excessive conditionalities that marked the 90s and the early parts of this century into a, a much, what I would call, it, healthier framework for administering uh, the funds. So let me just say this is a, a, a fantastic initiative, and uh, I really hope that uh, when uh, the governments get together uh, later this month, uh, this will be part of the solution. Professor Stiglitz, thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to move on to the last panelist now. Um, Ian Golding is Professor of Globalization and Development at the University of Oxford, former Vice President and Head of Policy for the World Bank, and previously Economic Advisor to President and Head of the State Bank in South Africa. Um, Ian, I wonder if you could focus on two elements of the FACE uh, proposal. The size of the funds, fairly modest, $516 billion. And secondly, on the fairly flexible approach to the timing and the grace period. Ian, over to you. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to participate in this and to build on the comments uh, of the previous speakers. 
Uh, firstly, to very, very strongly endorse and welcome this initiative. Uh, if not now, when would we do something like this? And if not of the scale, uh, what scale can be proposed? This is the greatest development disaster in all of our lifetimes, uh, and it requires a response which goes way beyond that which we've seen so far. The rich countries have allocated $13 trillion, um, well over 10% of their GDP to themselves. That's right that they do that. Uh, this unprecedented fiscal response to safeguard workers wherever possible, um, and mostly firms, uh, but less than 1%, uh, $100 billion has gone to development, and that's a scandal, uh, because there's never been a time when it's needed more when it would be more wisely used and when it would save more lives. Worse than that, because the GNI, the size of the incomes of the rich countries is declining, uh, the UK is must be by about 20% this year, ODA will decline dramatically uh, by about 20%. So it's not simply that uh, the needs are not being met, the support is actually declining at this time. And as Joe has so wisely pointed out, the institutions have never been better capable of dealing with it. So this disconnect uh, needs to be addressed urgently, and that's exactly what uh, this initiative is doing. The terms, uh, I believe, are conservative, sensible, uh, modest, and they are very similar to the IDA terms. Um, indeed, I think as much as possible should be given in grants, but to the extent that loans are regarded as a responsibility, these are essentially IDA terms. Um, in fact, they could be even lower interest rates given the current negative interest rates prevailing in many of the markets. Um, as was indicated, the Marshall Plan, the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions during the Second World War pointed to the hope of a better world. And what we really want is an understanding that COVID-19 is a wake-up call. It's about which world we go to. And uh, what I don't like about the bouncing back idea is it implies we go back to where we were. Uh, we need a totally different uh, types of integration um, to that. It's where we were and business as usual uh, and a restoration of that that would give us a dystopian future of escalating climate change, increasing inequality within our countries and between them. What we need is a radical change, and that, as was envisaged by Roosevelt, uh, by Beveridge in the UK, uh, and by others in the war, war setting, is what is called for to ensure we have a sustainable, inclusive future. Uh, this would include a Green New Deal, a radical debt reduction of the HIPIC site, uh, and SDRs, as Joe has mentioned. The the terms of the loan, my, in my sense, uh, could be enhanced by as much grant element as possible. And what this also implies is, of course, that it's primarily public sector, uh, but we need as well a contribution from foundations uh, like the Gates Foundation, like the many other foundations which have resources uh, which can be mobilized to complement this, as well as the private sector, which should be setting aside a much greater share of their activities towards the restoration uh, of the growth prospects and the, the development prospects for developing countries. The scale of what's happening here through the collapse of incomes from remittances, tourism, uh, commodities, and other exports, tax revenue receipts domestically uh, against the domestic needs uh, is unprecedented. And the credit rating agencies, too, need to be brought along. And my view is that that is a very neglected and important part of this, because we've seen this rather strange situation where a number of countries have refused uh, on grounds of their credit worthiness uh, receiving debt write-offs uh, or concessionary loans in recent years, not least in the last six months. That is simply because they have been threatened uh, by the credit rating agencies with downgrades uh, if they restructure their debt uh, or receive the downgrade. So a necessary element of this has to be that it does not negatively impact on the credit uh, worthiness 
of countries. Many countries, over 20 African countries and low-income countries have come into the markets for the first time since the financial crisis. That's a massive achievement for them, uh, which should not be threatened by this. So the, the credit rating agencies need to understand that the object of this is to put countries on a sound financial footing for the future, to give them development prospects, to try and achieve the SDGs, and therefore to undermine their credit through this, I believe, is a perverse incentive uh, which needs to be managed. There's much that needs to be done. Uh, previous speakers have emphasized the breadth and depth of this ambition, which is totally support. It is very small and modest in proportion to what is needed. Uh, and I hope that the president of Costa Rica and the excellent initiative goes forward with all speed and power as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a fantastic uh, set of three panelists, uh, very eminent uh, panelists. We obviously have a very clear message. It's in everybody's self-interest. If not now, when? You know, we must not get business as usual out of this uh, transformation. FACE is a modest but realistic uh, a way to make progress in support of middle-income countries to address uh, the crisis that they're facing and that development banks can play a significant role in the delivery of FACE. With that, I now want to move to um, the statements from the floor, and I'm expecting everybody to be very disciplined. We have a lot of people wanting to make interventions. If you can keep to two minutes, uh, I'd really appreciate that. I may sort of cough um, and just to encourage you to come to a conclusion so that we can go through all of the speakers from many countries that wish to intervene. The first uh, intervention comes from Jamaica. Uh, Senator, the Honorable Camilla Johnson Smith, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. Uh, over to you. Good morning, President Keseda, uh, Prime Minister Sanchez, colleague ministers, Executive Secretary of ECLAC, uh, distinguished panelists. I have the honor to represent our Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness, and co convener of the initiative in respect of co financing uh, for COVID 19 and beyond, as has been indicated by President uh, Kezeda earlier. Uh, in that stead, allow me to start. Uh, on his behalf by commending President, uh, you and your team uh, for the work you have done as convener of Working Group 3 and for the effective outcomes that have been presented to Ministers of Finance. The realities and deficiencies in our current financial arrangements are clearly untenable as they disproportionately affect vulnerable economies such as SIDS and other highly indebted middle-income countries. The commendable feature of the FACE Fund is that it is it will provide a source of liquidity for developing countries both in our region and beyond through investment capital at concessionary rates to enable priority public investments in pursuance of the SDGs and indeed we've heard complimentary suggestions this morning the proposal for the fund and mechanisms to finance it certainly demonstrate the kind of bold and innovative approach that is required to see us through the pandemic and beyond we therefore commend Costa Rica and other contributors to the discussion group for being one of the first out of the gate with this creative thinking. The advent of the pandemic has also highlighted the urgency of access to state-of-the-art digital technologies by, digi by developing countries such as ours, as access to a wide range of services and business continuity have been severely impacted by inadequate broadband to treat with e-learning, e-government, and e-commerce which are critical to our management of and recovery from the impact of COVID-19. We therefore believe that FACE represents a true avenue to treat effectively with this priority need. Mr. President, colleagues, Jamaica therefore looks forward to working with you all on this initiative and very much hopes that it will receive the requisite support of our international development partners. Thank you once more. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Senator. You set the pace uh, with some very strong messages and staying on time. I want to check if uh, we have uh, Kenya online. Okay, so if Kenya joins later, we'll come back to them. I also want to check whether we have the United Arab Emirates online. 
Okay, these were the two that we were uncertain about. That's great. So I now want to move on to Georgia and His Excellency Lasha Darcy, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister. Um, Minister, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Your Excellency. Excellencies, at the outset, I'd like to thank His Excellency Carlos Alvarado Quesada, President of Costa Rica, for the presentation of, of the fund. Ladies and gentlemen, nine months since the first outbreak of the coronavirus disease, we have witnessed an enormous pressure on healthcare system worldwide. Massive surge in deaths, growing uh, unemployment, poverty and inequalities. No doubt that COVID-19 pandemic has not only affected our daily lives, but also devastated economies across the globe. Well, across the globe. Therefore, the depth of economic distress experienced by countries remains unknown. Since the very beginning of the pandemic, the government of Georgia has undertaken active measures to contain the spread of the virus and to ensure that uh, no one is left behind. Georgia's fight against the COVID-19 has been viewed as a successful example worldwide, though our economy, like others, suffered massive. Excellencies, large-scale, coordinated, and comprehensive multilateral response is needed more than ever to address the pandemic induced socio-economic devastation. International financial assistance and debt services have proved to be valuable to, to mitigate this uh, severe economic stress in many countries. Here will let me highlight the immense role of fiscal and monetary policies and financial funds in effort to reach global financial stability. In this regard, we welcome Costa Rica's proposal to create the extraordinary support fund and look forward to its official launching. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude in conclusion, and we reiterate our readiness to join efforts with the international community in addressing this unprecedented economic, social, and humanitarian crisis. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. I now would like to move on to the Maldives and Ali, Ali Abdul Rahim, Senior Fiscal Policy Advisor. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Your Excellencies. Let me start by extending our appreciation to Costa Rica for this initiative, the fund to alleviate COVID-19 economics phase. Uh, as you know, Maldives is among the most severely impacted economies in the world by the COVID-19 economic crisis. This stems from our dependence on the tourism industry for our production, for our foreign exchange earnings and the employment uh, and well-being of our citizens. Due to the COVID-19, pandemic, we were forced to take the unprecedented step of closing our borders in late March, practically closing off our tourism industry for the first time in over five decades. Government revenue, which is also dependent on tourism sector, has declined drastically, and now we are faced with financing a substantial financing gap to fund not only the day-to-day -day expenditure on public administration and services, but also to fund the added expenditure on managing the medical response to this pandemic, supporting workers and families, supporting businesses affected by the crisis, to keep SMEs afloat and to support the economic recovery. The needs are immense. As such, Maldives welcome uh, this initiative by Costa Rica, the FACE Fund that would provide financing to developing economies on concessional terms. The areas of allocation identified, identified by the FACE funding are also critical areas for uh, the Maldives at the moment. In terms of amount of funding eligible for each country from the FACE fund that has been proposed, I would highlight that 3% of GDP would still be far from what we need now. As such, we urge to consider the vulnerability and the economic impact of specific countries in determining the amount of assistance that countries would be eligible for from the fund. I would highlight especially that the need to fund the economic recovery during and after the pandemic. We need funding to support the resumption of economic activities for the new normal that we are entering now, the length of which we still remain, that still remains uncertain. In this regard, I would like to highlight that the Maldives has announced the establishment of a global trust fund targeted for restarting the global travel and tourism industry. We feel that this trust fund as well as FACE fund uh, could exist parallelly within the universe of funds and facilities to support economies suffering from the COVID-19 crisis. The fund we propose are more surgical and targeted towards one sector, the travel and tourism sector, which is, the, which is critical for tourism dependent economies such as the Maldives. In July, since we reopened our borders in the tourism industry, the recovery has been slow. 
the reality is that even though we have reopened, we need airlines to fly to the Maldives and we need to build the confidence of our visitors across the world. As such, one area we need to invest specifically is in the rapid COVID-19 testing. We are a country where we receive double or triple our population as visitors in a normal year. So we need to invest in testing at the airport, airports and tourist facilities to build the confidence of airlines and visitors to the Maldives. A tourism focused trust fund will bring in the partnership of public and private sector to re-establish the travel connection safely and securely by supporting investment in such facilities as testings and diagnostics at the airports. This, ultimately, uh, this is ultimately a positive sum outcome for all, private and public sector, the airlines, the travel agencies, the hoteliers, as well as the tourism dependent economies. If we are able to restore our tourism sector to even a fraction of our pre-COVID level, that would give us financial autonomy to support our vulnerable populations, our workers and our economy on our own strength. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity for this intervention and I welcome the insightful contributions from the panelists so far. Thank you. Great, thank you so much uh, for your intervention. And now I would like to turn uh, to Canada and His Excellency Bob Ray, the permanent representative to the UN. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you so much uh, to President Alvarado for his uh, leadership and uh, his immense contribution. Uh, together with my colleague, uh, Courtney Ratray, the ambassador of Jamaica, uh, and Amina Mohammed, we have been helping to steer this, uh, this process to, towards the meeting that's uh, taking place on Tuesday. I guess it's just a couple of things I want to stress. The, the first one is that uh, I agree with all those speakers who talked about the, the disconnect between what is happening in the advanced economies and, and what is happening in the rest of the world in terms of the amount of monies that have been allocated to deal with the crisis. And this is a disconnect that we are going to have to resolve. Um, we are one world. We, we cannot uh, succeed unless uh, we succeed for everyone. Um, and I think it's a, it, it's, it's a challenge in a time of increased nationalism and an increased expression of self-interest. It's a challenge to get to the expression of solidarity. But as the Secretary General said last week, he said, I thought it was a wonderful phrase, solidarity is self-interest. It's in our interest to do this together. Um, we're, we're gonna face some uh, interesting discussions and debates in getting to where we need to get to. Uh, the existing architecture is not sufficient. It's not going to work well enough to get us through the depth of this crisis. Uh, and as many have talked about, Professor Golding, Professor Stieglitz, I think have talked about the, the need for new institutions and new approaches. Uh, and we need to have the courage to, uh, to do that. And we can draw on our collective experience. We have done this before. Uh, we have been able to get to a better place uh, in the past, and there's no reason why we, we, we can't do it now. And finally, I just want to say the cost of not responding in a generous and imaginative and creative way, the costs are going to be absolutely huge, not just for the developing countries, but for all of us. And so that's the reason why I've been urging uh, my colleagues in government and elsewhere to say, look, we can argue about the modalities, we can talk about uh, the terms and conditions of various techniques we might want to use, but we have to be much bolder and think much bigger than we have been thinking so far. And that's the approach I know that my prime minister will be bringing to these discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, I now want to go to Pakistan and His Excellency Munir Akram, permanent representative to the UN. So you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. And I would like to thank uh, the distinguished president of Costa Rica uh, for this very timely and very important uh, initiative uh, that he has brought to develop a cogent response to the crisis we are facing. I think as the remarks here have made clear, we're facing a triple crisis, a crisis of COVID, the crisis of the climate challenge, and impose on that the obligation and the imperative to achieve the sustainable development goals. If we do not if we are not able to respond to all three crises, we face an existential moment. Uh, it is 
a moment which could see the erosion of international cooperation. It could see the erosion of the United Nations and the foundations on which the United Nations has been built. Therefore, this is not only a challenge to developing countries, it is a challenge to the world of how we will respond. The distinguished Secretary General the other day spoke not only of solidarity as self-interest, he also mentioned a concept which, with which I personally disagree, which is the prospect of a fractured world. We cannot afford a fractured world. There is no such thing as a fractured world. It will be a world which will be in utter chaos. Therefore, we need, we have done the thinking, the Secretary General, Canada and Jamaica's initiative has come forward with some, um, and not only a menu of options, perhaps is denigrating it, but it has come forward with some, some good ideas on how we should go forward in responding to the financial challenge that we are, that we are facing and face the proposal that has been made by Costa Rica is an important part of, of that, that response. But I foresee challenges, challenges because of the experience we have had of the last 75 years, where although a Marshall Plan was mobilized for Europe, a similar plan was never mobilized for the developing world. All of us here, many of us here, including uh, Richard Kozul Wright, Professor Stiglitz, all of us have argued for a fair globalization. How far did we get? If we did have a fair globalization, we would not be in the situation that we are today. And therefore, there is a challenge to political will, and we have to see and focus on how to mobilize that political will. The Secretary General, Jamaica and Canada's exercise is a, only a first step. I do not see that this will be a quick exercise. We are, of course, in an emergency, but that political will, do we have that political will? Can we mobilize that political will in order to get that emergency response? Therefore, we will need to be engaged at the head of state level, President of Costa Rica, uh, others like my own prime minister. We are prepared to join together in order to mobilize the political will that is required to get the decisions from the governments of the, the, the reserve currency countries. That's the key that we have to convince the central banks of the currency, the reserve currency countries to be able to inject the money that they can inject and they can help to inject, they can help to mobilize both from the public and the private sector. We have to have a coalition that is mobilized in favor of obtaining that political will because without that, we can discuss good proposals. We will not get the results. Thank you very much. Ambassador, thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to turn to Indonesia um, and the um, Deputy Permanent Representative, Ambassador Mohamed Koba. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Moderator. Uh, His Excellency, uh, President of the Republic of Costa Rica, and uh, Her Excellency, the Deputy Secretary General of the UN, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First, we would like to thank the Government of Costa Rica and ECLAP for confirming this meeting and also to all panelists for the briefings. And so would, uh, uh, this COVID-19 uh, pandemic has obviously created an unprecedented multidimensional crisis. And this poses challenges uh, for many developing countries with their limited uh, fiscal space in dealing with the crisis of this uh, magnitude. Overcoming this crisis requires global solidarity and massive mobilization of resources and finance. 
We highly appreciate the initiative by His Excellency President Quesada to establish the phase. Um, it is important to mobilize financing for developing countries in mitigating and addressing the impact of the pandemic. And, and we think that the international community must respond in, in, a, in an uninnovative and organized manner. Having said that, and having seen the broad idea of the proposal, we would be very interested to understand and know more about the details of the initiative, uh, such as the funds management and the eligibility uh, criteria and the relations uh, to the to the mechanism that we have, to the UN mechanism. Uh, I think it would be useful to understand the uh, roadmap to materialize this initiative. Thank you. And Indonesia looks forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, to, great to have those questions put on the table about, you know, how the, what does the next steps look like and how could the modality be, be operationalized? So I now want to turn to Yufen Li uh, from the South Center. You have the floor. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Uh, to set up the FACE Fund is an important and very welcoming initiative, uh, which could enlarge the toolkit to address the enormous challenges faced by developing countries now and beyond. Uh, the large scale financing needs to save lives and livelihood and maintain economic, social, and political stability during the pandemic and the recovery process go far beyond the physical ability of developing countries. Debt servicing has further weakened the financial position of these countries and increased human suffering. For developed countries, many have adopted what it, whatever it takes policies to engage in both monetary and fiscal expansion to support their economies and people. But for developing countries, they simply cannot do it. This initiative carries the potential to bridge some of the financial needs, help countries' lack of adequate liquidity, boost confidence, and mitigate systemic risks. Phase Fund is also a risk-sharing mechanism in providing financial support to the distressed economies. The funds need to reach a significant scale for it to be influential and to be able to bridge the financing gap. Technical de details relating to how to raise sufficient funds and also how to be accountable still need to be worked out. International cooperation and support for this great initiative is urgently called for. I wish you success in this important endeavor. Me being the independent expert on debt uh, and human rights of the United Nations together with my colleagues, we stand ready to offer support and assistance whenever this is there is the need. Thank you. Thank you so much for your intervention. So I now like to turn uh, to Mr. Jose Antonio Ocampo uh, from CIPA Columbia University, and we'll hear from him on a video. This crisis has been characterized by the limited international financial cooperation with developing countries. There are some important proposals on the table that must be adopted. One of them is a major issue of a special drawing rights from the IMF, which will give about 40% to developing countries. The second is a capitalization of all multilateral development banks so that they can contribute to the recovery of the emerging and developing countries as they did in the 2008-2009 crisis. And the third is this very important initiative from the government of Costa Rica uh, to create a special fund base uh, with an amount of $500 billion that will be channeled to the multilateral development banks. I will contribute to uh, both middle-income and low-income countries with 50-year loans uh, at very low interest rates and no conditionality. It is really a major proposal, uh, and I hope it will be adopted by the international community and supported by developed countries. 
Great, thank you so much. Now we'll turn live to Mrs. Stephanie Griffiths-Jones from the Initiative for Policy Dialogue. Over to you. Thank you very much. I want to congratulate uh, the President of Costa Rica and Cepal also for the support for this very important initiative. I think if we look a little bit at the lessons of previous crises, we see that the major danger, the greatest danger, is inaction or insufficient and too slow action. Whether we look at the Latin American debt crisis, which led to a lost decade to development, the Sub-Saharan African debt crisis, which led to HIPIC being really very late, and even the Eurozone debt crisis, um, it, 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 10 years ago, uh, they all were characterized for too little, too late. And I think this is one of the great strengths of this proposal because it has interesting proposals, but on a sufficient scale. And, uh, and I think the parallels in history are first Roosevelt's response uh, to the depression in the 30s, and particularly, as was mentioned, especially by Richard, uh, the, um, the Marshall Plan, where the U.S. Uh, gave about 3% of GDP uh, to help rebuild Europe. And it was t tremendously effective because it led to a very rapid recovery of industrial growth within Europe um, in a very short period of time and to a golden age of growth and development uh, in, in, in the European region. Um, I think the FACE program is very attractive and has very valuable elements also, which may make it attractive for the richer countries. First, because it, it has grants rather, sorry, it has loans rather than grown, loans rather than grants. Uh, although maybe not so good for developing countries, I think it makes it much more likely for richer countries to concede resources at that uh, through that modality. Furthermore, it stresses fiscal responsibility, good governance, and commitment to environmental sustainability, which are particularly the latter, uh, clearly global public goods. So I think that the fact that it is long-term finance, which is good for developing and emerging economies, but at the same time, it, are, it is not grants, could make it attractive both to developing emerging and richer countries. I think uh, I agree very strongly with Joe Stiglitz, who said uh, that it's also very good that it will be, these resources will be channeled through international financial institutions, and particularly the multilateral development banks. I would emphasize, I think, the importance that regional development banks could play because they have a greater knowledge um, of the countries in their region. And I think that besides the contribution which they make about knowledge, uh, channeling it through development banks can give more strategic use of these funds to achieve inclusive and sustainable development. But it can also leverage more funds, for example, from the private sector and from climate finance funds. So one idea which President Alvarado actually mentioned is to use part of the space initiative to increase the capital of the multilateral development banks so that they can lend more themselves, but can also leverage more money uh, from the private sector, as was done so effectively during the 2007-2009 crisis and has, and has not been done yet. And I should mention perhaps quickly that there is a, a summit of public development banks in early November uh, with the support of the UN Secretary General uh, and convened by President Macron, uh, which will try and precisely enhance the role of development banks, um, not just uh, at the multilateral regional level, but also at the national level. And uh, to reinforce a point that Richard made, um, it was interesting that the Marshall Plan funds contributed to create uh, the KFW, which is one of the best development banks in the world. So American funds were used to capitalize this new institution. And perhaps that is another use that could give, be given to pay so that we would have at national level stronger and larger uh, development banks. 
Thank you very much and all the best with your initiative. Great. Um, Mrs. Stephanie Griffiths Jones, thank you so much for your intervention. And we come now to the last uh, intervention from the floor, which will come from Sir Richard Jolly uh, from the Institute of Development Studies by video. Space is an important initi initiative and deserves widespread support. It could indeed provide vital support, especially for children, the next generation on which all countries depend for their futures. Many people think that because the direct effects of COVID-19 on children are not as small, children are little affected. That's not true. The indirect effects are huge and can indeed be catastrophic. This is not only if and when their parents are affected, but for all children, because the lockdowns and global economic declines are impacting virtually on all poorer and middle income countries through reductions in exports, imports, investment, and other economic consequences. FACE could provide important support for overcoming the worst of such repercussions. Thank you. Great. Um, that was from Sir Richard Jolly. Now we move on to the closing remarks. And I would like to thank everybody for being so disciplined with the time. Uh, I'm going to pass on to uh, I invite uh, Alicia Barcena, the Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, to deliver her closing remarks. Alicia, over to you. Thank you so much, Richard, for the fantastic job done as moderator, first of all. And I would like to recognize here the leadership of Canada, the presence of Bob Ray in Jamaica with Camina Johnson Smith, and of course, uh, Courtney Rattray, that I know he should be connected. I would also like to thank you, President Alvarado, for this great initiative. Rodolfo Solano is also with us, and, and we feel very proud for this initiative. And of course, Anka Joseph Stiglitz, Young Golding, Stephanie Griffith Jones, thank you very much for joining us today, and, and of course, the ambassadors of New York. I would like to, to say a couple of things. Number one, the, the global community really needs to counter the contraction of the world economy and place financial stability as a key global good. Financial stability as a global good requires a bold response. I love what Bob Ray said, uh, uh, that the, the world needs bolder responses. And the world is not short of liquidity, we said that. And uh, as, as has been shown by the developed countries, developed countries have acted in their self-interest with 13, one, three, 13 trillion dollars. And they can be counter-cyclical without regard to their liquidity or exchange rate parities. Developing countries do not have that privilege. They are limited in their fiscal and monetary space. And as Joseph Stiglitz said, face is not only solidarity, it's reciprocity because we developing countries have contributed to the reserve currencies of, of those countries, to the reserve currency countries. So, uh, and I love the notion that the disconnect between the developed and the developing countries needs to be resolved. And this is what FACE is about, because FACE is an instrument to fill in this important gap, to bridge this disconnect. And the proposal is modest, frankly, $516 billion is not much, and, and, and we have to move ahead because the existing architecture is not sufficient. So we need, we need, we need a, a fund that has the vision of the future that has to be seen and has to be seen as additional. We have to make sure that the multilateral banks or institutions do not understand this as competing. It has to be as additional, additional with no conditionality, with a long-term vision, with incentives for green recovery and equal recovery, and I do believe, and this is my, my final comment, that the international community has to stand up to, to tangible results next Monday. I really hope that we will be able to, next Monday, ne ne I'm sorry, next 29th, which is a Tuesday, actually, that we will be able to see, to agree on phase, to agree on the SDRs, to agree on debt relief for the Caribbean middle income countries, at least, a resilience fund that could benefit immensely from face. So I really hope that uh, the world will stand up to the needs of, 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 the, of the emergency today. Thank you so much. Thank you, President of Costa Rica. 
Thank you to all for your participation. Thank you, Richard from UNCTAD, and we are very grateful to you as well. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Lisa. So now I'm gonna move on to invite His Excellency Rodolfo Serrano Curios, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Costa Rica, uh, to make thank those comments. You have the floor. Thank you, thank you so much, and good morning from the sunny San Jose, Costa Rica. Today is a great day after listening all these discussions. We have hope. We have hope. Excellencies, President Alvarado, we have heard today that there are economic circumstances in which many countries around the world find themselves, and by default, the increasing hardships that our people are encountering and how vulnerabilities and gaps are more evident now than ever. We have also discussed ideas on possible solutions including President Alvarado call to create a fund to alleviate the economic consequences of COVID-19. As a closing thought, I would like to reflect further on multilateralism in the context of this anniversary of the United Nations and this historic General Assembly session. Multilateralism is built on jointly facing challenges with political will, constructive dialogue, negotiation, and the commit work of diverse partners. From that diversity, we must be able to stimulate, respect, and build bridges that close our distance towards a common path, which is a resilient recovery and a more sustainable world economy. We need multilateralism and international cooperation now more than ever to support people and business and avoid financial crisis in the developing world, which like a domino effect will affect the entire world economy. All stakeholders have important role in preventing economic disaster and in a building a more equitable, sustainable and fair economy. We must continue maintaining in the highest priority the goals we set out 75 years ago for a future of greater shared well-being for all. In Costa Rica, we remain convinced that together, through the sum of our efforts, we will once again find this common path. The proposal presented today draws on these principles and will benefit enormously from your engagement and thought-provoking comments on this short but fruitful event. These are critical for the collective consideration of our options going forward, and especially towards the continued shaping of the phase proposal. We will await further questions and observations ahead of the Head of State's meeting on financing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable De Development in the Era of COVID-19 and Beyond on the next 19th, in which phase will be discussed as one of the policy options. To conclude, the government and the people of the Republic of Costa Rica wishes to thank our partner ECLAC, especially our great, great friend Alicia Barcena, for her steadfast support in this as in other common endeavors. And of course, our distinguished experts and panelists, and all of you for your accompanying, accompanying us today. We hope to continue to work with you in this initiative. I wish you a good day, a successful high living week. Thank you, have a great day. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. I now back to uh, President uh, Alvarado, just to say a, a few words, and thank you for staying with us. Thank you, Richard, for being a great moderator. I want to thank all the participants for their contributions. Thank you, Alisa. Alicia, gracias por la inspiración y la fuerza. Thank you, Richard, for your right, for your thoughts, and also to, for being direct and ambitious as well. Thank you, Professor Stiglitz, for pointing out a path 
going forward. Thank you to Ian Golding as well for his thoughts. Yeah. Uh, thank you to Stephanie Griffith Jones also participated. It's great seeing you. Uh, and to all the people that took the floor, I want to also thank especially Sir Richard Jolly, my professor from Sussex University, who also participated and also caring about children in this. I also want to thank our ambassador to the UN, eh, Rodrigo Alberto Carazo. Gracias por tanto trabajo y al equipo. And also eh, economical advisor Oton Solis, who has pushed as well and give a lot of thought and work together with me and with Rodrigo Alberto to make this a reality with the whole team. I would just like end up saying that if somebody asks me what face is after this and after listening to you all, I will, uh, fa I will answer face is a global Marshall Plan to rebuild better from COVID-19 and to be born into a better new world. And perhaps that image might expose what FACE is all about. Uh, we take the comments, as, the, as our foreign minister said, because this is only going to make it richer and a better initiative, particularly the one that mentioned it's uh, in its amount and quantity modest. Um, well, we can, we can, as a former friend of mine said, we can make it bigger. Uh, but thank you all. And now my call is to let's recruit support, let's go further, let's persuade both altruism and self-interest and put it aligned with this. Thank you all. President Alvarado, I think you've said it all. And uh, you know, as a humanitarian, this proposal from place must get supported and implemented. So we will also, you know, everyone must support the actions of Prime Minister's heads of state on the 29th of September. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Gracias. Thanks. Bye, Camina. Thank you. Thank you for Thank being you, here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Excellencies. Thank you.